So this book is brand new. The book was uh, planned originally. I started to, I signed the contract for it about a year ago. And the plan was to write about the series of quite dramatic efforts that Hong Kong people had made to push back against being absorbed into, uh, completely into the People's Republic of China. In 1997, as many of you know, Hong Kong went from being a British colony to being uh, part of the People's Republic of China that was promised that for 50 years, under something called the One Country, Two Systems uh, framework, it would be able to maintain its distinctive way of operating, which was very different from mainland cities, with a freer press, more freedom of assembly, and a different economic system as well. And generally a different feel, a more connectedness to the wider world, use of Cantonese and English as lingua franca, as opposed to Putonghua, Mandarin spoken on the mainland, and so forth. Hong Kong was promised this for 50 years. Right before the handover happened, some people thought that right after the handover, all that difference would be stomped on, would disappear. Hong Kong would be instantly transformed into just another uh, Chinese city. That didn't happen. When it didn't happen, people also thought maybe what would happen would be something different. Maybe Hong Kong's distinctive way of operating would infiltrate the mainland. Hong Kong ways would flow across the border and other Chinese cities would become more like Hong Kong. That was a kind of hopeful scenario for people who wanted to see the People's Republic of China change. That also didn't happen. Clearly something more complicated happened. There were some changes to Hong Kong's way of life. There were some small amounts of flow across the border. What tended to flow across the border were Hong Kong modes of consumption. Malls in places like Shanghai started to look more and more like malls in Hong Kong. But there were some moves to make things in Hong Kong a bit more like the mainland. But then since then, there have been a whole series of protests that have been about pushing back against efforts by the mainland to try to bring Hong Kong into line. There were protests in 2003 against a proposed security law, in 2012 against a proposed change in the local educational curriculum that would have made Hong Kong schools have something more like the controlled patriotic education that's true on the mainland. Uh, and then in 2014, the largest protests up to that point, the umbrella movement, was a sit-in on uh, Occupy Zones in two parts of, of Hong Kong, three parts of Hong Kong, that lasted for weeks on end and were the biggest sustained um, protests, urban-based protests in China since the Tiananmen protests of 1989. Those ended without achieving the main goal of the protesters, which was to bring about a true election for who would be the chief executive in charge of Hong Kong. Part of the deal of Hong Kong becoming part of the People's Republic of China was supposed to be that it would be able to elect, as it could not, under colonial rule, the person who was the most powerful member of the government. Instead, what happened was there's a controlled election for that position, which Carrie Lam currently holds, in which a small slate of candidates, all of whom have to be, if they're going to win, approved by Beijing as somebody who can go along with them. So anyway, the protests in 2014 were to try to change that structure and bring a kind of true universal suffrage to the city. After that failed, the feeling among many people in Hong Kong was one of disappointment and frustration, an idea of inevitability of the reins tightening. And while there were more efforts to push back, there was an idea that maybe Hong Kong's days of being a different kind of city were numbered. And when I signed on to write the book, a uh, year ago, I thought the story would largely about these efforts to fight and then the die being cast and it largely being a story of tightening control. But one of the things about Hong Kong that's a continual thread through its very complicated, interesting, turbulent history is that Hong Kong and its people have a way of surprising, uh, surprising observers and making fools out of forecasters. And so anybody who thought that the movement was over was completely wrong. In, uh, starting in June, there was the start of the biggest wave of protests to date. And then people, as they observed it, thought those protests would just last a week, two weeks, a few weeks, and they've lasted for months and months. Again, proving forecasters wrong. So that's the story of the book. The book changed. 
it went from being a story that ended with the kind of post-umbrella movement uh, frustration and despondency. One of the things that I knew I would um, quote in the book was something that uh, Louisa Lim quoted in The New Yorker at the end of the umbrella movement when she talked to somebody who described, used a popular culture reference to explain their feeling after the umbrella movement. They said that it was like the film The Matrix in which you take a pill in which you suddenly see the world as it is rather than the glossy surface. That up until that point you could pretend that everything was fine in Hong Kong but now things had been revealed that actually the future was this very dark one in which um, Hong Kong would inevitably and electably be drawn into uh, People's Republic of China becoming more of an ordinary part of a PRC that at that point was moving into darker and darker modes. But once again, Hong Kong surprised. So that's the book is about that sort of on the brink and hovering there and trying to push back against being brought over the end of it. One thing that I like to do when I'm talking about um, a book or when I'm talking about a, a current affair because these get filmed and they get put online um, and people can watch them, I want to always have something about the talk that says you're listening to this right now. And also the Hong Kong story has continued. It didn't stop when I finished working on the book. I picked a date to finish the book uh, to stop dealing with, with further events, October 1st of last year. That was the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. It was actually when um, a fair number of people thought um, the protests in Hong Kong would have to end because Beijing, um, under Xi Jinping, who was determined to show off his country as a strong um, country and to celebrate everything about the Communist Party, was holding a massive parade and spectacle to mark that 70th anniversary. There was a thought that there would have to be a tightening of something done to end the protests. But on October 1st, instead, there were two stories that competed for global attention. One was the big parade in Beijing, and one was the latest protests in Hong Kong. And the story also became the police, who'd used very hard, strong-arm tactics against the protesters from June on, fired its first live ammunition. Uh, up until then, they'd been using rubber bullets and beanbag shot. And lots and lots of people had been injured, but there hadn't been live ammunition used. So October 1st, that symbolic competing events in Beijing and Hong Kong, a story of celebration of how in control um, the Communist Party is, but a demonstration that showed an effort to push back. That was the end point. But the protests have continued, and the Hong Kong story has not gone away. It's actually periodically gained more attention in the US. So I thought what I would do is start by giving you some images um, from, from related to the book and the events I covered in it, but actually going forward to the present moment, so you know that you're seeing this now. The talk won't be the same in a week or in two weeks because different things will have happened. So this was, these are shots of um, what I thought the book would be about or I thought the book would end. This is a candlelight vigil held on June 4th of, of this year. Every year on June 4th, the anniversary of the massacre in Beijing near Tiananmen Square in 1989, there are um, commemorative events held. They cannot be held anywhere on the Chinese mainland, but in Macau, which is also under the one country, two systems structure, and in Hong Kong, Macau, another former colony, um, there can be vigils held. In Macau, there tends to be a very small one. In Hong Kong, there's been a very large one. I'd never been. I was determined to go um, this year. The book wasn't yet called Vigil, but I knew that I wanted to attend um, this vigil. I called the book Vigil, by the way, in part because it turned out there was another book called Hong Kong on the Brink already out there. Hong Kong's been on the brink before. That one was about 1967, another turning point moment in the, uh, in the city's life. But I thought Vigil, which was suggested by the, um, by the publishers, had a nice resonance to it. And I knew that this actual vigil that I took part in um, would be an important part of the book. I was determined to go this year, in part because I wanted to write about it, but in part because being on the brink means it's not clear how many more years into the future Hong Kong will still be able to mark an event that cannot be marked this way on the mainland. The mainland pretends that the event never happened. 
when there were the protests in 2012 against the textbooks being changed, one of the key points was the textbooks in Hong Kong talk about a massacre that ended a series of largely peaceful protests by large numbers of people. On the mainland, the event is ignored or it's said to be the work of a small number of rioters. So the Tiananmen events are very important to the story of Hong Kong this way. So this was a photograph I took at that vigil. This is a, a photograph after I got home when I started writing the book, um, not yet knowing how much it would be about 2019 events. And it concludes um, a book that I picked, picked up in Hong Kong that I was glad I was able to find, but it wasn't as easy to find as I, as I hoped, and that I think says something. It's by Joshua Wong, um, the international symbol of the, uh, the Umbrella Movement and a leader of the 2012 movement when he was just in his mid-teens. Um, it's called Unfree Speech. It's letters he wrote while he was in prison after the movement in 2014. After the Umbrella Movement, one of the things the government did to try to rein the city in was punish the leaders by bringing them up on different kinds of charges. One of the things about the current movement that's distinctive, it's been largely leaderless, which makes it harder um, to break it. This here is a little um, object, commemorative object, that the group that uh, Joshua Wong is part of, uh, a political organization he and others founded, that's a small figurine showing the man who stood in front of the tank um, near Tiananmen Square on June 5th after the massacre. And this is what they were selling to raise money at the vigil there. Um, this was in early June after the protests had begun and it wasn't clear what the, the first giant march was June 9th um, and then on June um, 12th there were um, police started using uh, tear gas against protesters and some protesters um, broke into and occupied um, a government office. June, that, that, those two events were ones that really kicked the movement into high gear right after I'd returned um, to the United States from my Hong Kong trip. Uh, one of the things that emerged as uh, waiting to see what sort of symbol, there hasn't been a single symbol or a single photo like uh, the Tank Man photo that has come to symbolize uh, the 2019 and ongoing protests, but one of the first kind of competitors for that title was a shot of, uh, of a young woman sitting in front of, um, of police um, with, with dressed in, in riot gear. And there were several photographs like this that looked like they might become the counterpart um, to the Tank Man image. So those are things from um, the June trip to Hong Kong that was the last one I took before writing the book. But I was just back in December as well, so I'll give you some images from that as well. But for today, ripped straight from the headlines, meetings are going on at the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, Switzerland. Davos. And Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong, is there with an entourage talking about how uh, things are going to be okay in her city, even though there's this problem that protesters are violent. Not talking about the fact that the vast majority of the violence that has happened since uh, mid-June has been the most, the, the by far largest percentage of the violence that's been directed at bodies has been by the police in the form of beatings and tear gas with some and, and, shoot it, and shots of rubber bullets in particular and bean bags. There's also been violence by thugs who have not been uh, reined in by the police and have not been investigated by the police. Protesters have committed acts of violence a few acts of quite uh, horrific violence against individual people, against bodies, but nearly all of it actually in the form of attacks on objects, buildings and um, other non-animate objects. Carrie Lam, in talking about this, what's been going on in her city at the World Economic Forum with the rich and the famous from around the world, has only been talking about the violence coming from um, the protesters' side. This is an image of how Carrie Lam is viewed by some of the protesters. Um, this was a shot I took in December um, uh, when I witnessed one of the protests when I was last there. I wanted to be able to give you a talk that never showed Donald Trump, but in trying to bring the Davos, Davos meetings into the talk, I realized that this was a tweet that I wanted 
um, to use because Ishan Theroar, a Washington Post columnist who's covering, uh, covering that and writing, I think, the most interesting uh, coverage of events there, is somebody I'm going to be doing a book talk with at Politics and Prose in DC when I go on the book tour. And I like reading him to follow what's going on in Switzerland. So there was this in which he talked both about, uh, he wrote a, a sum up of what's been going on and talked about Carrie Lam showed little to no sympathy for the protesters' demands for uh, meaningful political reform in his update on this, which also deals uh, with Trump and Greta Thunberg. Also ripped from the headlines today, and this is something that um, suggests why, if I'll get to um, Clay's question about this sort of idea of why do Westerners care so much about Tiananmen or why might Westerner foreigners want to care so much about something going on in China. But one of the questions that comes up is, so why does the world, or why should the world, why should people say living here or someplace else, care so much about Hong Kong, about one, um, one city far away, that it's an anomaly that it's been able to survive uh, as, as free a place as it has while incorporated into a Communist Party state? Why should we care so much about the struggle going on there? And Susan Sadeline, who is a um, journalist who's been on the ground in Hong Kong for the most of the last um, five years, covering the protests um, of the Umbrella Movement and now very well, came up with at least one argument for that. And why she says about it, why, why we should care is in part because of what is the biggest news story of the moment coming out of um, Asia, which is um, the new strain of potentially uh, of a potential potential endemic or pandemic um, which is coming out of Wuhan. Now it's based in Wuhan which is not Hong Kong but what she points out is that when there was the SARS uh, epidemic years ago and the government in uh, in the People's Republic of China tried to keep it under wraps what was going on it was largely press coverage in Hong Kong where the media could not be controlled in the same way that helped alert people to what was going on and then put pressure on the mainland to, um, to start dealing with this problem. One of the ways that Hong Kong's difference has functioned has been uh, an important way to help news spread out of a tightly controlled place uh, where the government does not want anything that makes it look bad uh, to be circulating. Even when the government acknowledges a problem uh, Beijing wants to control precisely how they spin the, the story and they can largely control the media within its borders but they can't so far control the Hong Kong media and it is still true that the Hong Kong media is still has this is why Hong Kong's on the brink not completely over it has an ability to talk about things that can't talked about be talked about in the mainland media it's not just that there's a vigil every year on June 4th but newspapers remind people in Hong Kong and Macau what happened in Beijing in 1989. Newspapers on the mainland are silent about it. My book will not be discussed in any mainland press, but I was just interviewed by a reporter for the South China Morning Post who published the interview about the book, saying pretty nice things about it, in a Hong Kong newspaper. More importantly, though, is the possibility that things that are going horribly wrong within mainland China that the mainland um, media establishment might not be able to cover can still be covered in Hong Kong which can draw attention broader. So this is one way to, um, one reason to care about, about Hong Kong. These issues are all entwined. The virus is not something that is kept, stays within China. There have been cases outside. As I walked here to this talk, I saw tables in which uh, Chinese New Year which is coming up Objects related to it, to celebratory things, were being handed out to students, but so were face masks. Presumably for some who were going back to China, uh, international students going back to China for Chinese New Year, or perhaps simply because of the number of travelers for that time. These are some shots from my last, um, my last visit to Hong Kong. I still do not know what tear gas smells like. Um, though John Lanchester wrote a uh, novelist who spent part of his childhood in Hong Kong, uh, recently wrote a, a lovely diary piece for the London Review of Books, talking about that he had never thought of Hong Kong as a place he would go to speak at a literary festival, but now it has a literary festival and he spoke there. 
and he didn't know what um, what Hong Kong what tear gas was like. He didn't expect to smell it in Hong Kong, but there were protests there, and he did. But just in case, I did buy what probably would have been a terribly pointless kind of mask because I've suggested I do that, and uh, water to wash out. Uh, my eyes and saline solution. These were the advice that was given me when I was going to a large uh, march of the sort that had been tear gassed in recent weeks, but they weren't tear gassed. This is a shot of the protest on December 8th, months and months after um, the movement's uh, first uh, giant march, and quite a number of weeks and weeks after people had thought October 1st might be the end of the movement. And there's been another march of similar size um, early this year as well. Other things there I saw including one of the things the movement has moved to now is um, showing solidarity for protesters by shopping at stores and going to restaurants that support the movement, what are called part of the yellow economy because yellow, uh, the yellow umbrella became a symbol for the umbrella movement, so yellow and also has other uh, connotations, the yellow stores are ones that are seen as ones supporting the protests. So this was one, um, uh, a, a restaurant that was making clear this, this, these characters here in Mandarin at least pronounced Jiayo, which is like, it literally means add oil, but it means go, go protesters. So this was a store that had that, the way of saying like we support the protests. They had other things on there. Um, related to the movement, and including this one, which I like, because the movement had been going on a long time. People were getting despondent. It simply says, Hong Kong, cheer up. <laughs> Stick it out. Um, this, to show us connection between the 1989 protests and the present, um, Hong, Kong, Hong Kongers see themselves as fighting something that's distinctive, that's not just a carryover from mainland movements, but there are connections, including the vigil. The goddess of democracy was one of the key statues of um, the 1989 protests. And after that, it was toppled in Tiananmen Square. It was built by protesters similar to the Statue of Liberty, though different, um, given Chinese um, characteristics of various sorts. Um, it can never be displayed. It can never be shown anywhere on the mainland now. But the Chinese University of Hong Kong um, has, a, ha has a statue there. And I go to visit it each time I go back to Hong Kong to make sure the goddess is still there. As long as the goddess is there, Hong Kong's on the brink, not over it. The goddess is a touchstone. In 2014, students of Chinese University of Hong Kong gathered outside of it to hear, uh, in its shade, to hear uh, speeches by, um, by activists calling on them to take part in the Occupy movement that was about to start. When I went back there a couple of years ago, it's one that's sort of a pilgrimage thing. I go there each time when I go to Hong Kong. It, she was clothed in a skirt uh, with black and white stripes. And along the white stripes were written the names of Hong Kong's first political prisoners, Joshua Wong among them, and others who were less well known and had longer prison sentences, had less media attention on them. Um, but all of them were showing a connection, a localizing of a symbol uh, of Beijing. And I think one of the themes of the Hong Kong protests to keep in mind is it's about local issues, keeping a, a city different. It's linked to a national and regional story, and it connects to symbols from there. And it's robustly international and cosmopolitan, drawing inspiration from around the world, and at this point having an influence on places around the world as well. There are tactics being used in Hong Kong that are now being picked up by protesters in other places. More so, actually, than tactics that were used in Tiananmen were picked up by protesters in other places. Tiananmen didn't add any real tactic to the global repertoire of protest actions, but the, um, the airport occupation, the leaderlessness, which isn't just Hong Kong, but is Hong Kong's part of, and other things have been uh, be water strategy, what protesters have said, of being very flexible in their moves. All of these things that are partly refined in Hong Kong and then um, flow other places. At the same time, Hong Kong people draw symbols and tactics from around the world. This, is, this latest localization of the goddess is she has a um, placard around her saying, five demands, not one less, which has become the mantra of the movement. The movement initially had one demand, an end to an extradition law 
that would make it possible for people that Beijing wanted uh, to subject to the unfair legal system across the border and were in Hong Kong that would make it easy for those people to be sent to the mainland. After months and months, weeks when um, the government refused to withdraw this bill, and then when they said the bill was dead but wouldn't actually withdraw it, and then finally they did withdraw it. Um, so that's one of the demands has actually eventually been met. But by the time it, met, it was met, there were four more demands. And the cry started to be that we want all of these demands. The most important of the other demands is a full investigation by an independent group of police brutality. And that's why it's so significant that I mentioned Carrie Lam being at an international setting, acting as though the police have not done anything that needs to be investigated. That, I think, is the one thing that more than anything else has kept the movement going after such a long time, even when many people would think exhaustion alone would get people to stop protesting or a sense of being, in, uh, being unable to achieve what they want to do would get them to stop from protesting. That, more than anything else, a sense that the police are out of control and the government doesn't care about it, has given the movement, participants of the movement, a sense of a last chance effort, a last battle that needs to be fought to the end. The last thing that I saw in Hong Kong before coming back on uh, December 14th, in my last visit, was a vigil put on by um, high school students um, in the shade near the Hong Kong Art Museum. It began with a moment of silence for all the people who've either died or been seriously injured um, in the cause of the movement. There hasn't been a massacre, there hasn't been large scale uh, killings, there haven't been uh, the clearly defined public killings that there have been uh, not just in Tiananmen, uh, not just in 1989 in China, but in other movements as well. There are massacres um, of protesters in other settings. But there has been a high degree of, of, of serious injuries and enormous amounts of tear gas used. And there have been some suicides by, uh, by youth who've claimed um, that they're giving their lives because of their um, sense of frustration at the situation. And there is a long tradition in other places um, Tibet being the most obvious one, perhaps, of a suicide linked to a cause. Um, one of the events that's not always remembered uh, that led to the um, Czech Velvet Revolution in 1989 was a commemoration early in 1989 of the 20th anniversary of the death of Jan Palak, who was somebody so frustrated by the inability of um, Prague Spring to bring about change in that part of the world that he killed himself. And this, so this kind of political suicide to try to galvanize is something that happens in different places. But along with that, there was one of the things that specifically this event was about was a youth who had um, fallen to his death off of a parking garage as it was being tear gassed. And this was seen as the same as a, as a police killing. So the last thing I saw after completing vigil while it was going into press was a vigil. <coughs> These are some other um, images. This is an image of the goddess of democracy at the time when um, I saw a few years ago when she was wrapped in a black and white um, skirt. Um, and it says uh, the, the Chinese just translated, even if forbidden, the resistance will continue. Even if imprisoned, our thoughts will not die. That was a couple of years that was ago. That was in between the Umbrella Movement and the 2019 Movement. So even though it's often going to be told in history as one movement and then another, there were events in between to keep it alive, including that. Uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong, um, where this stands, was one of two uh, Hong Kong uh, universities that in uh, the fall were turned into siege areas where um, activists were, were creating Molotov cocktails and police um, laid them under siege. Another kind of um, event I want to talk about, again, tying it to not today or not this week, but this moment in time, just the last couple of weeks, which Clay brought up in his introduction, was the Taiwan election uh, recently. This is a shot from the Umbrella Movement of 2014. Um, my favorite photograph of the ones that I took of, a, um, of the scene that had a kind of festive feel. If a lot of the themes of the recent protests have been a sense of a battle or a ritual, a solemn ritual, 
In 2014, there was a sense of a kind of carnival in the streets, a festival. But one of the key, um, what are the key images there? Well, obviously, there was one mocking Xi Jinping, which you can't do on the mainland, but you can still in Hong Kong, and people wanted to show you could. But here, Taiwan beware, Jin Er Xianggang, uh, Ming Bai Taiwan. Today's Hong Kong could be tomorrow's Taiwan. In 1997, when there was the one country, two systems was being, in, being introduced, one of the ideas that Beijing had, which the Chinese Communist Party always has wanted Taiwan to be brought into the fold too, was to say, just watch Hong Kong. See what a light touch we put on Hong Kong. And then you can imagine how Taiwan eventually could become part of the People's Republic of China with a similar kind of light touch. So there was the idea, if you're in Taiwan and you're wondering what things will be like if you ever got incorporated into the PRC, just look at Hong Kong. Hong Kong people here were saying, Taiwan people, just look at what's happening to Hong Kong. And if you worry about what's happening to Hong Kong, let that be um, an object lesson for you to worry about what your future could hold. And in this most recent Taiwan election, though there were many uh, factors that played into it, the party that won, um, and Tsai Ing-wen being re-elected, was somebody who had a much more skeptical or tough uh, line against Beijing than the competitor, who at a certain point was viewed as, as having potential to win. So one of the things that helped tip the balance or make the win as big as it was, was people in Taiwan looking at Hong Kong, seeing the police brutality, seeing something that looked very much like martial law, something that existed in Taiwan, but Taiwan people are rightly very uh, proud of having left behind them in the past, happening there. So the Taiwan election, this was something that ran in the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, referred to the Taiwan election, Hong Kong won it, Beijing lost it. Again, note this is running in a Hong Kong newspaper, totally unlike what would have run in any mainland newspaper, where the story was international interference tips the election in favor of um, the terrible Tsai Ing-wen. But still, the idea of a connectedness between that, I think, is important, and why the story of, um, of Hong Kong is one that isn't important just to Hong Kong. It's important to the world, and it's important to the region. So here are more shots from early June. Uh, I took here is the march by lawyers, uh, a solemn march by lawyers on June 6th, uh, the last thing I saw in Hong Kong um, before I started writing the book was a march by several thousand lawyers and legal professionals, a silent march by people dressed in black. It wasn't described as a vigil, but I think it's worth thinking of it as a vigil. A vigil for the rule of law. A vigil is not just something you hold for somebody or something that has died. It's something you, hold, you, you sit vigil for something you fear is on its last, um, last legs. So this was a vigil-like event by um, lawyers saying that if the extradition bill goes through, and people can be wished across the border where they won't have legal protections of counsel and things like that, then the rule of law will be dead. I want to bring up one more thing from, uh, that I haven't mentioned yet, but I think it connects to something I've said, which is we need to think of the Hong Kong protests as something that both are rooted within a locale and about a locale, have to do with regional forces and have regional effects, and something that's robustly global. One of, the key, um, one of the key symbols and gathering places of the 2014 protests was something called the Lenin Wall, which was set up in the Occupy Zone in uh, the Central District, Business District of Hong Kong. The original Lenin Wall was put up in Prague in the early 1980s in honor not of Vladimir Lenin, but John Lenin of the Beatles. After he had been uh, assassinated, this was done to show that the spirit of what he had imagined in songs like Imagine, a world beyond the Cold War um, tensions, a world of peace, a utopian kind of vision, could survive even in a country under authoritarian rule and even in a time when somebody like him had been killed. So in Prague, still under Communist Party rule, people used paint and other things to express their ideas on something, a wall that they um, named for John Lennon. 
in Hong Kong, the protesters who also put up some banners that said, had a key line from the song Imagine, um, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Look how many of us there are, kind of thing. And in one of these, um, on here, there is actually a, a drawing with John Lennon's face and that, um, and that line. But in Hong Kong, so they called it a Lennon wall, an international symbol. And rock music and different kinds of music have been important in the movement, as they were in the Tiananmen protests as well. Um, they named this for John Lennon, but they localized it. So it was a global kind of thing, but they localized it by using post-it notes in the very kind of um, studious and clerically minded Hong Kong. And they also individualized it in that people would write out their own uh, kind of statements on it. And during the umbrella movement, there was a Lennon wall, which was wonderfully photogenic, kaleidoscopic, uh, celebratory place. During the 2019 movement, which is a continuation in a sense of the umbrella movement, but also doing things differently, there are now Lennon walls all over the city until the police take them down and then they're put back up. The post-it notes are all over. There are walking Lennon walls, people that put a lot of post-it notes on themselves and walk around. There are Lennon tunnels. So there's taking of that individual thing, and actually it moves very far away from, um, from John Lennon in some cases, but, and there are other songs that have taken the place of Imagine, things like that, but John Lennon isn't completely out of the picture. On Christmas Day, an artist, and also to show that, um, that the spirit of dissent has not been crushed, did a light projection that, held, that, that blasted up that said, tyranny is over um, if you want it, which was an homage to something that John and Yoko had done decades before, war is over um, if you want it. Again, in, put, they had put up billboards in multiple cities around the world, including Hong Kong, say that. So another connection to the past. And this is a Lennon Wall window of a um, restaurant, again, to show you eat here if you support the movement. Um, which, again, which also includes a drawing, a quite nice drawing of um, a young woman in, um, in gear to survive a, um, uh, a clash with the police. The movement, another sign of the internationalism of the movement, another photographs, photographs I took, uh, this is at the march on December 8th, the large one, and this is at the vigil afterwards. At the vigil, there's somebody wearing a mask from V for Vendetta, a globally popular um, graphic novel and, and, um, and general part of youth um, culture. And an even more widely quoted one, if, you burn, if we burn, you burn with us, from the films uh, out of the Hunger Games series. Hunger Games. So this is a photograph of Jennifer Lawrence as Katniss, the heroine of the Hunger Games upheaval. The Hunger Games, um, as a young Hong Konger that I interviewed for the book said, was enormously influential to, she's about 20, for uh, Hong Kongers of her generation. And it's a very powerful story about um, young people who are determined, uh, spoiler alert, they win in the end, defeating a much better armed um, opponent. So if you think of this as a kind of last ditch battle uh, to save yourself, and uh, the people taking part in it on the front lines include uh, teenagers about the same age as Katniss was when she led the successful rebellion. You can see the appeal. So it can either have a fatalistic kind of last stand, even though we know it probably can't end that way, or but amazing things can happen, sense to it. Um, before having the Hunger Games brought to my attention so much, I would refer her to the Hong Kong protests as a David versus Goliath story, and it's the same kind of um, story that way. A live free or die, a live free or die trying, this was at Chinese University of Hong Kong graffiti that was put up during the siege that I mentioned, that I wasn't there during the siege, but I saw afterwards. So this was in mid-December, and police at that point as well. Um, I want to end with um, a couple of things and then get to questions. One is just um, to talk about a metaphor that I use in the book and you'll need to read the book to see if you think it works. And this is to think of Hong Kong 
during the Cold War as a parallel space to West Berlin. They were outposts of greater freedom and greater capitalism at the edge of a large Communist Party run state. They were listening posts where people would go, journalists as well as spies, to try to get a sense of what was going on in the largely sealed off place across the border. John le Carre, the great, science, the great spy novelist, got this kind of sense of the two places as parallels. He wrote mostly books set in Berlin early in his career, that's what he became famous for, but he wrote a book set in Asia, The Honorable Schoolboy, and he had it begin in Hong Kong listen, with people listening in on the mainland. In the thing about Hong Kong and Berlin that's intriguing is they were divided cities during the Cold War. There was West Berlin where you did things one way, you could go shopping, you could watch movies, that you, things you couldn't buy, things you couldn't see, uh, just across the, the wall in, in East Berlin. The press was di operated different in West Berlin than in East Berlin and so forth. It was much easier to travel to one. It was much easier to get out of one. Hong Kong similarly was divided. It wasn't one city, but all of Hong Kong was on one side of the wall, but just over, just over the border on the mainland, things were as different uh, from Hong Kong as they were uh, from West Berlin uh, to East Berlin. After 1989, well, and about 30 years ago right now in 1990, Germany was unified and Berlin was turned into one city again. When that happened, the ways of life of West Berlin pretty much took over East Berlin. After 1997, Hong Kong was made partly whole with the places over the border on the mainland. And the question was, what would happen? Would Hong Kong ways flow over the border or would ways over the border flow into Hong Kong? Largely the fight has been about people in Hong Kong not wanting to end up being in the place of the East Berliners who saw their way of life uh, disappear. So here's the Lenin Wall, a nice homage to a Cold War um, bit of protest. Um, and it's a wall. Ber Hong Kong is not defined by a wall the way East and West Berlin were defined by a wall. But the wall, uh, the Berlin Wall, had two sides to it. On one side of it, the western side, there was a lot of colorful graffiti. On the eastern side of the wall, there was blank concrete, heavily guarded, because people didn't want, the, 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 the East Germans didn't want people getting near the wall because they might try to get over it. The fear wasn't that people would be escaping from West Berlin into East Berlin. This looks not just like the Lenin Wall, but a bit like the West Berlin sides of the Berlin Wall. When I went back to Hong Kong a couple of years after the Umbrella Movement, that same wall had become this, a place that you could not post um, anything on. It was transformed, and Lenin walls are continually being torn down to try to be transformed into blank walls of concrete, more like the East Berlin side of the wall when they look like the West Berlin side of the wall. So for me, that's a kind of symbol. There are others as well. Um, one of the things that was seen as a symbol of the creeping uh, control of um, Hong Kong was that a high-speed rail station opened within Hong Kong with trains from the mainland. So when you get through a checkpoint, going into uh, checkpoints going through the wall were very important. One side held, handled security on one side, another side handled security very differently on the other. But in the checkpoint, of the train station in Hong Kong, mainland security handles the checkpoint, which has a kind of chilling effect potentially, like suddenly having the Stasi in charge of Checkpoint Charlie in the old divided Berlin, where you were, if you were at Checkpoint Charlie, you were on the safe side. All right, I'll get back to this in a minute, but I wanted to end. So I've had, this is a very heavy, kind of story in many ways, even though there's an inspiring side to it. This is a very dark um, moment in global news cycles. Um, things have really moved in a very dark direction, yeah, already dark. I mean, the story with Hong, with Hong Kong, with the story with China, from my point of view, has been very dis increasingly disturbing over the, last, um, over the last couple of years, even besides Hong Kong, setting it aside, at the other edge of the People's Republic of China, there are horrific human rights abuses taking place in Xinjiang. In general, Xi Jinping has been more of a control-obsessed um, 
personality cult kind of leader than, Hong Kong, than China had seen for a very long time. And then we add the terrors in, um, in our own country and in other places. So this is a dark time, but I think any talk that people come out to listen to should not be completely devoid of humor. So I wanted to just say, as though it wasn't enough, revisit a little bit of Clay's lovely introduction to me by showing off some of my books and hopefully having a punchline about them. So Student Protests in 20th Century China was my first book about protests in Shanghai before uh, up to 1989. After that, I wrote a book called China's Brave New World and Other Tales for Global Times, a set of um, essays about China and globalization. Then I wrote a book about Shanghai, um, about the city itself and how it changed over time. So these are three books that develop, you know, mark the evolution of a scholar, but there's also something else they have in common. They keep getting smaller. <laughs> they keep getting shorter. So after that, I did China in the 21st century, which is actually smaller, too. And then I wrote a book called Eight Juxtapositions <laughs> that fits in a back pocket that's full of quirky kinds of comparisons, a bit like that Hong Kong um, Berlin one. And at one time, I thought I'd do a new edition of that, and, and what, what would be the, about Hong Kong and Berlin would be the small one. So now I think I'm on a trend the other direction. Because this book is very, very short, but it actually is a little bit bigger than the last one. So that's my effort at humor. Thank you for laughing. Um, but I wanted to say, and I, there's something I really like that, um, so that is a very self-promotional thing. I mean, I'm selling a book, and meanwhile I'm telling you I've got a bunch of other books too. And I didn't think there'd be any other, uh, my, uh, my newest book. But what I want to do is something that a comedian that I like, uh, a comic writer I like, does um, at the end of his talks. Not that I'm anywhere near as funny. But David Sedaris, who feels bad about having events that are meant partly to sell his books, he always tells you to buy somebody else's book instead. And he says, you know, I'll sign my book, but what I'd really like you to do, here's a book I really like, and it's for sale too. And he won me over because at one point, the book he chose, for no real reason except that he liked it, was Peter Hessler's River Town, which is a book by uh, one of my favorite China journalists to read. Now, I'm not quite as generous, or I guess I care more about my book sales than maybe he needs to. So I'm going to tell you two books that you should buy, but they're not out yet. So you can't buy them instead of buying my book. But I think you should have them on your radar because they're important ones, interesting ones about China. And they actually relate a little bit to things I've been um, saying. And they'll be available for you to look at afterwards if you want to, or the line's too long you know, for the books to buy mine or sign them. One is Mara Fistendahl's The Scientist and the Spy, a true story of China, the FBI, and industrial, uh, industrial espionage. Mara Vistendahl is one of the most talented journalists who's been dealing with China for um, the last years. I first got to know her when we were both following the same protest uh, in Shanghai, her from on the scene, me from a distance. Um, it's a great read. It's coming out in February about the same uh, time as mine. And the other is uh, James Carter's Champions Day, The End of Old Shanghai. And J James Carter is a historian like me, uh, interested in Chinese cities, interested in cosmopolitan port cities, and how their special status is altered or at least challenged. So he looks at the last day of the Shanghai race course uh, when the Japanese um, were taking over uh, much of China. And Shanghai, which had stood out as an unusual kind of city that was more part of the world than just part of China, in many ways, that was a magnet for people from many different places, was a font of creativity in many ways, um, began to be, began to lose that kind of uh, special status that sent, set it apart, and became absorbed into first uh, the Japanese Empire, and then after a period of being under control um, by the, the authoritarian Nationalist Party, got absorbed into the People's Republic of China. And over time, 
became very much like any other Chinese city. And there's a kind of chilling way in which, and in the book, just so you don't forget what book I really want you to buy, <laughs> the book talks about parallels between Shanghai um, in the teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s when it was a center of activism, uh, often student-led movements that members of other groups would join, and then the time when it got absorbed into these different kinds of, of empires and stopped standing apart as much. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>